Um, but my organization specializes, oh, by the way, when I say my organization, I mean just me. You know, you like to kind of make yourself seem a little bit bigger than you are. It's just me, I, it's me, myself, and, and my boss who approves my expenses, which is me, which is kind of nice. So I have a surface. Um, my goal is to help organizations get better at delivering software. Not just get better at delivering software, but help them deliver software that is of value to their customers, which is actually a little bit more difficult. Uh, in pursuit of that, I've been, uh, uh, I guess, uh, along a few lines. One is I, I've been a TFS guy for many years. I was an engineer. Uh, 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 well, that's maybe making it seem a little bit grander than it is. That's what you put in your CV. I, I coded for 10 years for banks and for all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of weird stuff you wouldn't imagine what you probably do because you guys code too. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org which is Ken Schwaber's organization, been around since 2010. And I'm a Visual Studio ALM MVP. That's a kind of, it's actually generally a kind of a weird combination of being in both process and tools. Because the tools guys tend to hate the process guys and the process guys tend to hate the tools guys. So I kind of have to fight with myself over that. Um, I, just a, a, a note, if anybody's coming to NDC Oslo, uh, you are awesome. You are welcome to come and join us for Tough Mudder afterwards. On the Sunday after NDC Oslo, uh, there's a group of us doing Tough Mudder. Jacob's going to be there, conference organizer. Uh, Adam Cogan's coming uh, for the second time, I'm sure. What's that? You're in? Awesome. Yeah, because you just want to watch that. Yeah, yeah it's pretty funny. Um, for those that don't know what Tough Mudder is, it's an 18-kilometer obstacle course designed by the British Special Forces. So it's kind of fun, running through fire and getting hosed, all kinds of weird stuff. It's, it's, it sounds harder than it is because you get to tell people you've done that. But it is a little bit easier. Um, but I, although I'm based, I'm actually based in Glasgow, in case you figured it out from the accent. But I don't spend much of my time in Glasgow, which you probably also figured out from the accent because you can understand me. <laughs> I spend most of my time uh, traveling around the world with different customers, sometimes the same customer in multiple places, helping them. Uh, uh, and it's interesting how different cultures approach the problems of Agile, of Scrum, of DevOps, and how that impacts on the way they do things, and ultimately the way the rest of us interact with other cultures as well. Because we in the West can be very critical of some of the Eastern cultures and the way they do things, but it's just different. Yeah, they're very critical of us as well, by the way, of how we do things. Oh, yeah, I had that. That was supposed to move when I clicked it. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, that I've been talking about recently is whether you want to be an amateur or a professional. An amateur is not really a good word, not a good fit for what I actually mean. So I actually co-opted an African word. Uh, I spoke at Agile in Africa two years ago. I did uh, one uh, last year as well. And it's a word, Kalabula. It's an awesome word because it actually means a bunch of things, as lots of uh, words tend to do. It, it, it could mean amateur, but it's a little bit more like cowboy, but maybe a little bit closer to con man. So maybe uh, uh, there's an inauguration today, isn't there? Maybe a little bit of Kalabula there. Because I believe that a professional software team is one that can deliver working software on a regular cadence that meets your customers' needs. How many of your teams do that? Yeah. Yeah. There are people that do that, but not all of us do. And you go to a different country, country company, and you have a different experience. And I've actually caveated this. For me, working software means that it, there's no crashes or unexpected behavior. Because people can, you, we'll just call it working and ship it anyway. That's not the same thing. How many of you have software that meets your customers' expectations when you ship it? Yes, I know you do. Do you ship at least every 30 days? 
Awesome. Is it working software every 30 days in front of your customers? See, you're pretty far down that line. Many people are not that far down that line. Many people try it, and they have a hard time doing it. So I try and rather than, I, I know I said con man, I use the word calabula, but I try and avoid uh, uh, putting down, it all down to malevolence. We're not deliberately doing these things most of the time. Yeah, unless you work for Volkswagen, I think. Maybe, maybe that was a little bit more deliberate. But I've also, Agile slash Scrum, they're really, they're really the same thing these days. I know they're different. I know that fundamentally, if you research these things, you, you find the differences. But when people say they're doing Agile, most people are doing Scrum. The majority of teams that are doing some form of Agile are doing some form of Scrum. And I do use the term some form of Scrum very loosely. Because for most teams, we're doing Scrum, but we're only doing stand-ups. Yeah, we stand up and have a two-hour meeting. And that's, that's us figuring out how to build our software. And that's not really what, what we want. We want to figure out why this thing is not working for us. Why has Agile uh, uh, slash Scrum slash whatever you want to call it failed to deliver? So I'm going to explore, I'm going to use Scrum as the example. There are lots of different ways of approaching agility. Most people end up in the same place. Some of you are delivering well, so uh, maybe some of the ideas I'm going to talk about don't apply to you, but I'm sure you'll have met them before. First off, we, we, we came up with some rules. The rules to play the game. One of the problems with the rules is most people haven't actually read the rule book. And the other problem is they think it comes with a strategy guide. If you go out and buy Monopoly, the board game, would you expect it to come with a rule book or a strategy guide? A rule book. You'll have to figure out how to win at that game. And if you didn't read the rules, would you expect to be, understand how to play the game? No, so why did so many people not read the rules? How many people here are doing Scrum? I'm okay if you're just calling it Scrum, that's okay, that's included in that. Yep, see more people put their hands up. Okay, how many of you have read the Scrum Guide? About half the people that said they were doing Scrum. Yeah, and probably that doesn't apply to the rest of your team because there's a reason you guys are at a conference. You're already in the upper percentage of people doing particular processes, practices, understanding your, your craft because you're here to improve it. You're going to different talks. So you're all familiar with the Scrum framework, yes? Okay, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of the sprint review? Do you wanna? No? Okay, yes? To demonstrate what you've delivered? That's, that's part of, that might be something you do during that. What, what's? There we go. It's an inspect and adapt moment, a Kaizen moment, whatever you want to call it. It's a place where we can stop, reflect on something, and make changes. We're going to inspect the product that we've just delivered, how we did it, and update the backlog. Yeah? It's the updating part that's the important part of that. A demo might or might not be part of that, whatever. Scrum Guide doesn't really talk about demos. You just want to sh present your work for feedback. But most people treat it incorrectly. Most people treat Scrum, I just picked one event, uh, but they all have the same issue. Every event in Scrum is there to provide inspection and adaption. Every artifact in Scrum is there to provide transparency. Do you guys have product backlog? Yes. Yep, is it visible to everybody in your organization? Yeah, it's on the wall. It's on the wall, there you go. Transparency. Anybody, a stakeholder, can walk past and see where things that they care about are, and maybe they want to go and have a conversation with the product owner. Transparency. 
And then we have three roles. People think of them as job titles, but they're not really, they're just roles. They're a hat we wear. We might wear other hats in our organization, but the three scrum roles are there to provide accountability. Each one is specifically accountable for something. And if it's not, that's where we're falling down a little bit. But what do people do with Scrum? I had a conversation with, there was an Agile talk in here at 9 o'clock, I think. And the guy coined this term. I don't remember his name. But he said, uh, most people treat Scrum as a checklist Scrum. We have a list of things. Are we, doing, are we, are we standing up during our daily stand-up? Check. We're doing it right. Forget the reason for having the thing in the first place. We've got that thing, we call it that. Do we have somebody who's called a product owner? Check. Do we have a project manager? It's like Scrum Master, Scrum Master. Check. Yeah, and it's not going to work. We need a product owner. We need them to be accountable for value in the product. That probably means they have profit and loss accountability. If you don't have profit and loss accountability, where's the negative impact of building the wrong thing? Are you really accountable if you're not in charge of the money? Many organizations, I, I've got a few anti-patterns here I want to talk about, but I want to talk about more than that, because ma many organizations use project instead of product. And if you focus on delivering project and you care about the delivery of project, well, your customers don't use projects. They use products. You need to make them the same thing. The money flows into the product, and you build different things in there. Otherwise, you end up with technical debt. You end up with fragmentation. One of the biggest anti-patterns is an absentee product owner. You might have somebody who's called that, but then they're not there. They're not available. They don't actually do the thing. They don't own the backlog. And if you don't get a good backlog from your product owner, who makes the decisions? The development team. You guys just go, well, we've got to do something. We can't sit here and do nothing all sprint. So we're just going to pick stuff to work on. Is that the right thing for your business? Does that fulfill the strategic direction of your organization? Maybe in a small organization, you guys have that understanding. But in a big organization, a big product, I've got an organization in Norway that I work with um, that has 90, 90 odd teams working on one product in 12 locations in nine countries. That's hard. Do all of them know what's going on? Not even close. So having an absentee product owner is really bad. My, my favorite one is when the product owner says they're too busy to turn up at the sprint review. That's my favorite one. And I always say to them, well, if, if you don't care about the product enough to turn up at the sprint review, why should your development team? Yeah? Absentee product owner, that's one of the big ones. I, I, if you're looking at, in your organization at why you're not being successful at Agile, the majority of the time, it's the product owner role that is lacking. It's not having good backlog. Uh, I, I have an expression, I say, if, if you walk into your daily scrum and your development team doesn't totally understand everything you're going to select from the backlog, and it's already got a value associated with it by the business, it's already got an effort estimation by the team, it's already been broken down and actionable, if that's not true, you're not doing refinement. You don't have a good backlog. That's the product owner's responsibility. You need to get there. Overcommitment of teams in their sprint is a really hard anti-pattern. It's a really hard one to get out of because people think they need stretch goals. The problem is we have this iron triangle from traditional project management that still hangs around even though we say we're doing Agile. Yeah, we still, still have people in our organization that want to fix schedule scope and resources. So the only thing that can vary is the thing they can't see. At least they can't see just now. 
is quality. What do we do in Scrum to fix quality? To put a pin in it. We have a definition of done. Here's our minimum quality bar we're going to achieve at the end of every iteration. That's the thing that I hold the development team accountable to. If you have a product owner but they're not accountable for delivering working software, you probably end up not delivering the right thing. Maybe you build awesome product, maybe you've got the best coders in the world, but if they're not working on the right thing, you're still not going to make any money or as much money as you could make. Product owner is critical and they should be looking at the market. If uh, anybody here have um, sales teams that sell features in your product that you don't have yet, okay, they shouldn't be doing that because you cannot make any guarantees in software about when something might be delivered. You, you just can't. Anytime you are, we're lying. We need to stop doing that. Again, we're back to Calabula. You see organizations like Microsoft who recently made a large transition to agility, they tell you about stuff once it's in the product. So they have a bunch of stuff that they turn off. They hide behind feature flags while they're still kicking the tires. But while they're still kicking their tires, they know that we can ship it because it's in the product, it's done. Might need some tweaking, but it's mostly there. We can say we've got that. And if you don't have a product owner that's looking forward in your market, looking at what your customers are going to ask for tomorrow, not just today, you'll end up with the sales team having to sell product features that aren't in your product in order to get ahead. Because your competitors have those features, so you have to. That's your product owner's responsibility to go and figure out what those things are and get ahead of that curve. And that's hard. I couldn't figure out what to call this. I know what I mean in my head. If you're British or anywhere in the Commonwealth, you will understand Chinese whispers. It's a little bit non-PC though, these days. In America, they call it the telephone game. Does everybody know what I mean? See, it's a couple of people shaking their head. So it's that uh, game that you play in school where you line up all, all the kids and you whisper something in one person's ear and they whisper it to each other all the way down the chain and what comes out the other side. It's not the same. So if you have a large distance and many people between you and your customer, how would you possibly expect to build the right software? Because what the message is going to get garbled, get tighter feedback loops more often. Just because a development team needs left alone during the sprint to go build something doesn't mean they're not involved in refinement, which also involves the customer. Get right up close to the customer. There's a lot of fallacies about Scrum. And one of them is that you don't want developers to speak to the customers. You want to keep them as far away as possible. Many people believe that that that's Scrum says you have to do that. Just like Scrum says you have to stand up during your daily stand up. Scrum master, also a very important role. I see most teams, most organizations that don't have good Scrum masters fail because people get distracted. They go off in different directions that aren't necessarily optimal. They have arguments in the team which disrupt the behavior in the team and there's nobody there to, to facilitate solving those problems. I'm not asking the scrum master to physically solve those problems, but they need to be there to facilitate it so things don't get out of hand. You heard the expression invisibly present. A scrum master should kind of be invisibly present. They've done enough. They understand enough about the team, the dynamics that they can kind of not look like they're not doing anything, but just tweak every now and again. It's a very powerful role, but they're responsible for the process. One of the biggest anti-patterns is taking a project manager and calling them a scrum master. It's not going to work for you. Generally, I find Project managers make better 
product owners because they usually care about the software and delivery. They don't care so much about the process, except when it serves their Gantt chart. Yeah. Lots of vanity metrics come out of project management because, again, we're thinking about project rather than product. I hate vanity metrics. Do you guys have any vanity metrics in your organization? Do you know what I mean by vanity metrics? Oh, vanity metrics are awesome. They make us look good. I used to work for Merrill Lynch when I was a coder. And we had this task we had to do every week where you fill out a spreadsheet with all the projects you're working on. Because you know you're working on more than one project. And you have to say how, how they are, and they have a little color coding thing that goes red, amber, and green. And most of mine would normally be red. I kind of sucked at time management. Yeah. But because five out of the six projects I was working on was red, all the coders handed that over to the, the team lead who got all of that data, pulled it together into his spreadsheet, and all of his projects go red. So he goes, oh, that's not good. I need to show some, something needs to be green and something needs to be amber. So he goes and tweaks the data until he gets it to look like he wants. And then he gives it to the project manager. And the project manager has lots of projects. And he does the same thing, tweaks it, and all the way up the organization. And then somebody at the top makes, makes a strategic business decision based on crap. Vanity metrics. That's not the worst one I've seen. That one's kind of understandable. I worked with an insurance company in the US who had five projects for the year. Every one of those projects had a, 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 a existed in this spreadsheet that was like an executive report. And it had original estimate in hours, actual estimate in hours for each project. Yeah, because obviously you want to try and get them as close as possible. And all of them were within 10%. Two of them were within 5%. That's pretty good going. One of them was dead on. I think it was 3,600 and something odd hours estimated exactly the same delivered. So I just turned it around and said, but this is, this is, this is BS. How did this happen? And I'm like, well, the figures were so bad, so much difference, and management beat up the project management team for it, that they decided to create a system whereby the project managers could submit change requests to the original estimate. And this, this, this project manager just got their change request in at the last minute. Business is making decisions on it. Calabula. It's fiction. But it's also common. OK, so we tried with, with just process. What else did we pull into to this puzzle of software delivery? I could, I could actually talk all day on process dysfunctions, but uh, we decided that, you know, well, maybe we need to focus on engineering a little bit more. That makes sense. Yeah, we need, we need some engineering standards. Continuous everything is a good idea. And I'm not saying it's not. Just like I'm not saying Scrum is a bad idea. Engineering standards are a good idea. But they kind of ended up a little bit weird because people like Microsoft handed us slides like this. Everything on that slide is a good thing. I'm not going to object to code reviews. In fact, I think they're a good thing. Automated testing, telemetry, release management. They're all things we should be doing, isn't it? I'm sure if you're delivering working software every 30 days, you've got quite a lot of these things in your software. It's built into the software. It's building? It's built, in. built into the software. Yeah. If you want to do it well and you want to do it fast, you've kind of got to build it in. OK, that sounds fair. Compile, deploy. Have you heard of that one? Oh, I've got a scarier story than the one you're thinking of. So I worked with a bank 
very large international bank in Europe. I'll not say where, because you'll guess the bank immediately if I tell you where. And they had five servers in their real-time banking transaction system. So this is real-time banking. And I was working with them, helping them get their code into TFS. And I said, well, where, where's your source control? I'm like, oh, we don't use source control. I'm like, what do you mean you don't use source control? Well, it just seems to get in our way and slow us down, so we don't do it that way. I'm like, oh, OK, you must have some really clever solution built into the software, whatever it is. What do you do? I said, oh, we, we log on to one of the servers, and we just run Visual Studio, change the code, and recompile it. And I'm like, oh, OK. You sure there's not some risk in that? <laughs> they seem to think it was fine. It was fine. And they're the only ones that know how to use, configure, and manage this system. So management can't tell them to do anything different. Because they'd be like, fine, we're, we're out of here. And then real-time banking system doesn't work. And I was like, so do you take those DLLs that you just created and then deploy them to the other four servers? And they're like, no, we find that doesn't work. We go and make the changes again on the other servers. Does that sound like a professional team? OK. Well, they're getting paid for it. So they're getting paid for it. I, I don't necessarily, just because we're getting paid for something doesn't, in, in, so we call professional football players professional football players because they're getting paid for it rather than amateurs. But in a complex industry, that's not how we do that. If you're, if you're a professional, uh, you normally are a member of a professional body. You probably adhere to standards, uh, uh, rules. Maybe you've signed up to some kind of, um, I don't know, what would you call it? Uh, 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 I will do no harm. Code of conduct. That's the word I was looking for. I'm pretty sure there's one for this conference for speakers. That's the one that stops me from swearing, even though I'm Scottish. It's very difficult. Some kind of code of conduct. OK. C can we agree that that's maybe a better definition of professional for our industry than just we get paid to do it? Because I've seen some VB code out there, and I'm pretty sure people get paid for it. Well, it depends on how you work. Sure. Well, yeah. You can be a bad professional. You can be a bad professional or a good professional, absolutely. I'm defining professional as in the good category, yeah. OK. So those guys aren't very professional. They're kind of amateurs. And I would just use amateur in that case, very amateur. What about if we're not getting feedback? Do you get, do you get feedback at the moment from your, I assume you get feedback from your customers? Yeah. Yep. Anybody use telemetry on their application to understand what's going on? Yes? Uh, software product? If some kind of telemetry in your application and you're going to view that telemetry, maybe you get telemetry on user usage, maybe you get telemetry on performance, maybe you add those two together and you can understand whether your deployment you just shipped is making your product suck and then you're getting less users. Or you change the way your homepage looks and you get less users or more users. That's good feedback. In fact, that's probably better feedback than talking to customers because customers lie. So you need feedback. Can we agree on that? Do you get feedback from your customers? Do you get customers in front of your product every 30 days, at least every 30 days? There's a few people nodding. Yeah. We need to get our product in front of customers so that we can change direction, so that we don't build the wrong thing for too long. Fail fast. Find out you didn't build the right thing as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, Starbucks in the US uh, define their effective planning horizon, which is a clever word for how quickly you need to deploy, yeah, as 48 hours. They have to go from an idea to deployed to every point of sale in the world in 48 hours. That sounds dangerous. And occasionally it is. Have you ever been to, into Starbucks and they can't take credit card payments? 
or they can't take your Starbucks card, because I have, every now and again they have a problem. We're cash only today. It's because something's gone wrong. But the value they get from deploying more frequently overwhelms the loss from taking the system down occasionally because something rolled out that was bad. At least, hopefully, that's the plan. Hopefully, they're using Octopus Deploy and then they can roll it back really quickly. Forward, forward, forward. They're going to roll it forward? Okay. Forward is much better than back. Well, if you've got data involved, What if you have no quality bar? Does, does everybody here have a quality bar for the product? It compiled. We've checked it in. Or maybe not checked it in. It compiles. Now it's good. We can ship it. You guys are octopus, aren't you? Okay. Okay. What company do you work for, sir? I've seen lots of teams that, that that's their standard for the code works. It's compiled. I usually ask them about testing, and that's the other team's problem. What do you mean that's the other team's problem? Do you have another team for tester, testing? Uh, yeah. big, fence. big fence. You just throw it over the top. Yeah. Throw some DLLs over. That's the best. What about for your ops team? Do you have an ops team that deploy it? Somewhere in the organization. Somewhere in the organization. But it's truer than you think. Lots of organizations still have the understanding that you need to have separate test teams. That organization I was talking about with 90 teams in 12 locations, they have QA teams that are completely separate from the development teams. Very rarely do they have testing skills on the development team. So how do you think their quality is? Yeah. Their software is $50,000 a license, and they make billions of dollars every year. So just because you don't have high quality doesn't mean you can't make money. And that's usually the biggest argument for not caring about quality. Well, we're still making money. So why should we care about that stuff? But if you look... If you have no quality bar, you're going to have undone work in your product. Stuff that doesn't meet the quality bar that should have been there. And that builds up over time, even if it's very small. Yeah? If even if it's 1% you didn't do every sprint, you go to ship your product after 18 months of sprinting, because that's what these teams generally do. And they find, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work. Do you have your, your tests first? You heard the expression, test first? Do you think it just applies to TDD? Many people only apply it to TDD. I apply it to acceptance criteria. I apply it to requirements as well. What are your testers going to go do on your software? If I don't have that up front, and I have a bunch of requirements that I give to my coders and I give to my testers, because, you know, they're separate teams, and my testers go and write test plans, but don't give them to the development team because they don't need them to go write the software, we should be able to build the same thing. What happens when we go to run those test plans against our software? Well, there's practically no chance of it being the same thing. I just spent four days uh, teaching two Scrum classes for a company. And I get them to build software in the class. It's Greenfield, so it's super easy. They have to build a website. But most of them weren't web developers, so that added a little bit of fun. And then the rest of them weren't actually developers. I had the CEO and the CFO in the class as well. But yeah, I make everybody build software. Because you have to have built software in order to understand the complexities of building software. Even if it's simple, so I only give them 30 minutes, so you know, that's hard. But it's difficult. That idea of uh, this no ops kind of has two meanings. I mean it as the wall between, we've, f we've fixed the wall between dev and test, but we've still got a wall between ops, so we throw it over the wall to some ops team somewhere. 
My favorite, uh, favorite example is a company in insurance company in the US, and their software is hugely complicated. It shouldn't be, because it's not a complicated problem that they're trying to solve, but they have 600 people working on it, 400 testers, because it takes 9,500 hours of QA to ship their product. Manual QA, because they've got no automation either. So why does it take, and they're not running their full regression, nowhere near close to running their full regression. What they're doing is picking and choosing based on what they think might be the things that have changed. And why do they do that? Because their software is full of technical debt. So DevOps was this thing. I think of DevOps as a set of practices that we're going to pick from. We're going to decide which ones make sense for us. Yeah? Some are going to make sense in your organization. Some are going to make sense elsewhere, or you might do them differently. But management got word of this DevOps word, and we kind of all have to do it, and they think of it as this magical ice cream. But we know it's another unicorn, but this unicorn is the one pooping the ice cream, and we still have to feed it to our team. I'll tell you afterwards where the screenshots come from. It's quite funny. But what we end up with, anyway, is still a rundown shack. That's software, that's the reality of the software that most people ship. Technical debt is an absolute epidemic in our industry. Those of you that are shipping awesome uh, skyscrapers of software that are, are beautiful and well-designed and well-maintained and easy to keep clean, you're, you're, you're not very common. That is not what is happening everywhere in the industry. I know that you guys exist as well, though. The people that build those lovely towers of awesomeness. However, you guys don't call me for help. So my picture of how people build software is very jaded the other way. Because people only call me when they're in trouble. Same as all the, the uh, DevOps and Agile consulting folks. So we do have a very jaded picture, so you guys do exist, but you're a very small percentage, very small percentage. So even though we're following the rules of Scrum and we're doing this DevOps thing, we've got engineering practices. We're moving, trying to move towards engineering excellence. We're kind of not doing that well because our choices are bad. So we're still amateurs. We want to be professionals. We don't have values. We're making decisions every day. Our product owner, our development team, our scrum master are making decisions every day about how we build our software, what choices we make. And we perhaps make them because that customer is shouting loudest. And that's not really the way we want to go. We need some kind of values to go by. I've got a list, if you're interested. We need courage. We need courage to say no to our customer. No, you can't have that by next Tuesday. We need courage to, to say to our product owner that things aren't going so well this sprint. So we get transparency. You can't have transparency without courage. You end up with vanity metrics. We need focus. We need to build stuff. Building software is hard. We need to be able to focus during a sprint. Focus on one thing. That doesn't mean we take the top 10 things off the backlog. And our mission for the sprint is to deliver these 10 various things, which means everybody in your team goes off and works on their own thing. That's not focus. Focus is coming up with a mission for your sprint a goal, what are we trying to achieve this sprint so that we can all work together to achieve it, and then selecting things from the backlog that meet that goal. So it might not be the top 10 things, 
They may be the top two things plus a bunch of other stuff. Helps us get focused. We're working on one thing, less distraction, less context switching. What about commitment? That's a good thing to have, but I don't want teams committing to delivering work in the sprint because commitment doesn't mean what people think it means. People think commitment means a guarantee, and it's not. If you look it up in the dictionary, it's pretty far from a guarantee. It's kind of a try really hard to do something. So we commit to delivering working software, to meeting our definition of done, and that mean, if that means we deliver half the things that we forecast we were going to deliver in our backlog, that's okay, because we've got working software. We'll work at a sustainable pace. I hope we're going to have respect. We're going to respect our customer to deliver them high quality that doesn't have hidden work. There's nothing worse than that little bit of undone work every sprint, and at some point your product owner goes, this looks amazing, this is just perfect, let's ship it. And the development team kind of goes, well, we can't quite ship it yet. We've kind of stubbed out this bit, and we need to finalize the tests for this other bit. And what happens? You end up with more work to do. The product owner can't ship to take advantage of some market opportunity. They've got to wait. There's no respect there for your customer, for your product owner. But the product owner needs to respect the development team as well. Everybody, everybody here on a development team. Who's on a development team? Okay. You want your product owner to respect your opinion as well, that you are a stakeholder to your product. And if you say that's a dumb order to do stuff in because of this technical reason, that they should trust you and respect your opinion to take that into account. Works always. And the final one, openness. We need to be open. We don't have openness and courage, we can't get transparency. We need to be honest with our customers. Things are forecasts. The reason your customers hold you to account for when things are going to be delivered is because you've proven time and time again that you don't deliver on time. It's not with the features you want and not when you want it. Yeah? Kill that by not making those promises. Accept reality. Forecast. Hopefully your customer doesn't hold the weatherman accountable for the weather he said it was going to be next Tuesday, especially in this country. Maybe if you're in the Bahamas, it's a little bit easier. So openness, we need to be open. Does that sound like a list of things that are bad, that we don't want in our company? Courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness? Because I'm hoping that nobody's sitting there thinking, nah, I don't want any of those things. But do you have all of those things? Can you think about the decisions that have been made within your organization, within your team, the interactions between your team and the product owner? And think about these, are you meeting them? Or is there something not quite right? Most of the time there's something not quite right. With the values, if we add the values to engineering excellence, so we're awesome at building code. We have a set of rules so that we're at least all going in the same direction. I, if you've got one man team or a two man team, forget the rules. Don't worry about the rules. Sit together, talk to each other and figure it out. Yeah? If you've got 15 people or even nine people in a team, two teams, you're gonna have to have some rules so we're all going in the same direction. Then we can be professional. We can make sure we're doing the right thing at the right time and meeting our customers' need. So we need all of those things. And I'm picking Scrum, but you could replace that with whatever your favorite flavor of agile process, as long as it's not beginning with a W. Common sense, you can put common sense up there as well. However, since most people don't have common sense, sometimes we need to write the common sense down a definition of common sense, yep. 
So then you, you've created your own little rule book for how you think things should go. Yeah. There's uh, super good information out there on this. The three uh, most important things I think to read about it, none of them come from me, so I'm not making money when you buy them. However, when your company fails to implement, I'm not, I can come and help you. That's one thing. But the Scrum Guide, it's only 17 pages. It takes you about an hour to read, and it doesn't say anything about user stories or planning poker or standing up. Although I think the modern thing is daily plank. Keeps the meetings really short. That's the modern one. If you're going to talk, you've got to be in plus it's healthy. Read the Scrum Guide. It's super simple, super straightforward. The values are in there. The framework's in there. Engineering excellence isn't, but it says you have to have it. You have to have a definition of done. Working software. So it's not going to tell you how to go do that because that's technology, organization, people specific. You guys figure that part out. Uh, super good book by Jeff Sutherland. Uh, he equates a lot of the Scrum practices to um, his military background. He was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. Uh, and it's interesting, the art of doing twice the features in half the time. If you have managers that are unsure or executive teams, buy one of these books and leave it in their bathroom. It's awesome. I want twice the features in half the time. That sounds awesome. And they go read it. And it's all about those fundamental things. We need to be doing the right thing, not just calling it those things. Uh, for those that don't know, Jeff is one of the founders of Scrum. Uh, he owns a venture capitalist company. He buys failing software companies, implements Scrum, and then sells them for 10 times what he bought them for. That's what he does for a living. He makes an awful lot of money doing it. So Scrum's got to work for him. And then Software in 30 Days, uh, which is both Jeff and Ken Schwaber uh, wrote that one, and it covers a lot of the aspects of how do you go about doing this thing in your organization, so it has more practices in there, more other things than just the core Scrum piece. How do you change your organization? Because change is hard. And it's not going to be just about your software teams. Your organization will have to change in order to move towards agility. I um, think we've got maybe a few minutes for questions. I probably covered a little bit too much. Does anybody have any questions? So I uh, covered some dysfunctions around implementing Scrum. There's many more in there. Some dysfunctions around DevOps and just some of the terminology limitations. I, I try and ignore the terminology except when I'm selling something. Yeah, you can sell DevOps. Even inside your organization, you can sell DevOps. It's a word to people, oh, yeah, we want that because everybody says it's good. But that's nothing to do with the implementation of the thing. Yes? Uh, you see it's uh, dealing with like, disparate teams, teams in different locations. If you've got uh, teams in different locations, good, good communication is key. Uh, so are they working on multiple products or one product? If you've got multiple teams working on one product, you probably want to look at one of the scaling frameworks uh, for the, the, the operator around Scrum. I try and avoid the ones that are really complicated. If you look at the diagram for it, you usually have some kind of diagram. If it's got hundreds of moving parts, I wouldn't bother. Keep it as simple as possible. Uh, being that I'm a scrum.org guy, I prefer their framework which is called Nexus, which is about using Scrum to scale Scrum, i.e. we don't need anything more per se, but we need more inspect and adapt loops. So just adding a few extra events to enshrine communication that we have to have when we've got multiple people working together and let the organization figure out the rest. A lot of the big frameworks have worked somewhere in some company's culture and they've created a blueprint of here's how it can work, and we try and apply it to a different company in a different culture, and it doesn't work so well. Nexus is about make your own that fits your culture, but here's, again, the minimum rules to follow. So I would look there. Start there. Use whatever practices make sense, though. Yes? What's your definition of DevOps? What's my definition of DevOps? 
that's a really hard, uh, I, I defined it earlier as, for me, it's just a set of practices that help us deliver software quicker. Yeah? Sorry? Many, many, many practices. I, 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 had a, I had a list of things up on the wall. Uh, let me bring that back up. Where did I put it? There it is. I stole this slide from Microsoft, so obviously their product meets these practices, but wow, I know. There's some wiggle room there. Uh, but monitoring, telemetry, continuous delivery. I, 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 I want continuous delivery, at least continuous integration. I want a minimum set of branches. Less branches is better. If you're gonna have lots of branches, they're temporary. Use Git. Yeah. Did you have a particular question? I'm, I'm okay. Um, I've, I've learned a bit about continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and integration. Um, I don't really know what an application lifecycle management is. Okay. How do they relate? So uh, that's, that's a super good uh, uh, question. So the question was, how does application lifecycle management, which is another term that we hear, relate to DevOps and Agile. There was actually a blog post by the ALM Rangers recently, uh, which had a little bit of that. I disagree with some of the detail in the blog post, but application, ALM is application lifecycle management. So I've got an idea about building an application all the way through to not only have we built the application, we've deployed the application, we've gone around our feedback loop, but that application's at the end of its life. So you know, the, you've heard the term SDLC, Software development, lifecycle management. That's the bit where you're building software inside of ALM. And DevOps to me is just a set of practices that helps us do ALM, but ALM's not a good term anymore. Yeah, if ALM doesn't sell anymore because people don't think it's awesome because it's, ALM doesn't care whether you're doing waterfall or agile or whatever. It's just you're managing the life cycle of your product and a bunch of practices to help with that. And DevOps adds speed to ALM deliver quicker. And Agile adds a little bit of organization to that that's not waterfall. Does that gel with your thinking as well? Another ALM MVP, Danny. Yeah. Does that maybe? Everybody will give you a different answer. I think I've got Donovan Brown's answer, who's uh, the Microsoft's DevOps guy. Uh, union of people, processes, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to the end users. That's his definition. That's a bit wider than mine and a bit more of a mouthful and it helps them sell TFS, but he's a, he's a, he's a product guy, so that makes sense. Any other questions? Cool, thank you guys very much. <laughs>